a small bump could have detonated the two anti-tank projectiles. Security was tight during the operation to remove them from underneath a house in Buchanan Street and once retrieved the bombs were taken in a convoy to Wall's End. There they were detonated at the old brick quarry site. However, if they had exploded in a suburban street, the effect could have been disastrous. Well, in that particular area, in the confined space they were, they would have definitely demolished that house they were under and possibly one or two houses either side would have suffered immense damage as well. Police say old bombs are frequently discovered. Well, in the hunted area, we're getting uh, a lot of incidences like this, uh, averaging about one a month in the uh, residential areas and uh, we're still finding projectiles around the beach areas, Stockton area, especially the old firing ranges and also up in the valley where we've been called upon to go to many of these incidents. What sort of steps should people take if they do find something they think could be a bomb? Well if they do find the uh, particular bomb, the first thing to do is most of all is leave it exactly where it is, don't even try and find any markings on it or anything and contact the police on Triple O. Since it was introduced to Australia, pampas grass has grown prolifically. It favours sandy conditions, but can be found throughout the Hunter Valley and Central Coast. Today in Newcastle, representatives from councils, Shortland Electricity, the Forestry Commission, the Department of Agriculture and other statutory authorities met to discuss the best way to eradicate the weed. There's a real concern that if pampas grass is not controlled, as has happened with a particular species in New Zealand, it may become a serious threat in forested areas. And it was introduced uh, quite a few years ago, mainly as an ornamental. But it has been found that even in garden situations, uh, once established, it becomes very widespread and out of control. And uh, in New Zealand, for example, where it was planted as a garden ornamental and for agricultural use, it has now escaped and become a serious weed of forest plantations. And we don't want to see that happen in New South Wales. The seminar was organised in response to the recent pesticide residue contaminations in export beef to the United States and Japan. Speakers included representatives from the Department of Agriculture, the Federal Department of Primary Industry and abattoirs. The Hunter Valley has been traditionally free of chemical contamination, but there is growing concern that the contamination problem will not only include beef and in some cases poultry, but also fruit and vegetables. Trevor Richards, pesticides inspector with the Department of Agriculture, says the amount of banned chemicals already handed in has been more than expected. This shed at Tokal was filled in only four days. Ironically, once all the chemicals are collected, they'll be shipped to the United States to be incinerated at an approximate cost of about $100,000. The Hunter Valley, um, because of its traditional use in agriculture, hasn't used a lot of the uh, pesticides that have been uh, banned, in particular DDT. It's a very low user and always has been. Um, there has been quite a quantity of chemical handed in in the past two months and these have been mainly dealdrin, which has been used by everyone from households uh, right through to large uh, producers and companies even of dealdrin. What sort of uh, quantities are we talking about there? Right, uh, the quantities handed in at Tokal, there has been uh, about one and a half tonnes of chemical. There has been two and a half tonnes up at Scone. Once again, you're moving into an area that tends to use larger volumes of chemical. Here it might be just five litre containers. At Scone, you're looking at 20 litre containers. And down at Gosford, there is about half a tonne of chemical being handed in. How does that compare with, say, the rest of New South Wales? Um, once you move out west, the quantities increase in and uh, there's been centres that have recorded up to six tonne of chemical being handed in one centre. There's obviously concern that, uh, that is, it's a major issue, the pesticide uh, issue. Have we seen the end of it or are we starting to get on top of it? No, we haven't seen the end of it. We've just seen uh, 
one particular area of pesticide come to a climax. A few years ago, you'll remember, there was 245T. At the moment, it's the organochlorines. Uh, tomorrow, it's, it, it could be pesticides in a different area. Meantime, meat processors are also feeling the pressure of the added testing procedures. Dick Bruce from Metro Meats at Gosford says his company tests about one animal in 50 at an average cost per beast of $38. Well, it means we have to test every beast that, that's a representative of a farm comes onto the works every day. We're testing at Gosford between 80 and 90 cattle every day. That must represent a, a huge cost to you too. Well, within New South Wales, it costs around about $7,500 per day. Do you think that that's uh, going some ways to try and solve the, the problem that we're facing now? Well, it's the best method the industry's come up with so far, Mark, and uh, I can't think of a better, better uh, way of fixing the problem. And despite all the publicity, Stuart King, Regional Veterinary Officer with the Department of Agriculture, says there appears to be some confusion still within the farming community over what chemicals can and can't be used. Yeah, there is, there is still some confusion in some people's minds. The major area of confusion that some people seem to be struggling with at the moment is the difference between the organochlorine group and the organophosphate group. Uh, the organochlorines were one of the first big breakthroughs in insecticides in the 50s and essentially the stability of those chemicals at that time was thought to be a very important factor. Looking back over many years it's also proven to be quite a problem with them as well and that's why chemicals like dieldrin and DDT and so on are now under a bit of a cloud. It's just simply because they hang around for so long. The next generation of insecticides which were generated was the organophosphates and they're quite different chemical structures and they are designed to break down in the environment, not to hang around. And most of those will break down in three weeks and they're gone. And uh, basically where people are concerned is where the organo part of the name is the similarity, but organochlorines and organophosphates are quite different chemicals and react very differently. I guess it comes down to individual responsibility then, doesn't it, if, uh, for the use of any sort of chemical? Well, there's an re individual responsibility. People must know what they're applying to their stock. They've got to spend some time to have a close look at the chemicals they apply and also this aspect of withholding periods. Nowadays, when a chemical is registered, it's um, looked at very carefully to work out how long it will last, how long it will last in the animal and what dangers surround that and if it's used according to the uh, recognised usage pattern and the withholding periods observed, then there's no danger to the public and that's essentially the responsibility of the producer. Since it was introduced to Australia, pampas grass has grown prolifically. It favours sandy conditions but can be found throughout the Hunter Valley and Central Coast. During the week in Newcastle, representatives from Council Shortland Electricity, the Forestry Commission, the Department of Agriculture and other statutory authorities met to discuss the best way to eradicate the weed. There's a real concern that if pampas grass is not controlled, as has happened with a particular species in New Zealand, it may become a serious threat in forested areas. It's an introduced exotic plant and it was introduced uh, quite a few years ago mainly as an ornamental. But it has been found that even in garden situations, uh, once established, it becomes very widespread and out of control. And uh, in New Zealand, for example, where it was planted as a garden ornamental and for agricultural use, it has now escaped and become a serious weed of forest plantations. And we don't want to see that happen in New South Wales. It was a very strange mission for the RAF and the Army, lifting a sculpture that weighs just over five tonnes from Tuggera, where it had been constructed, to its new home at a sculpture park set amongst eight hectares at Green Point. The enormous Chinook helicopter was soon hovering above the sculpture, and after harnessing it in a way that ensured it did not spin during the airlift, it was soon on its way. 
It was an extraordinary sight as the enormous structure made its way up the coast. Flying over houses and coastline, it soon caught people's attention. Chinook helicopters aren't known for their windless landings, and this one certainly kicked up a gale with downdraft winds of up to 160 kilometres an hour. South Australian sculptor Greg Jones watched nervously as his work, the dance continues, prepared to land. It was pure elation as the ordeal came to an end and the sculpture was safely on the ground. Uh, incredible, that's unbelievable. <laughs> I don't know what to say, it's great. Uh, it's a lengthy process from drawings uh, and then through to um, timber models. Quite a few timber models were done for this piece. And then finally through I, I, I made a, a steel maquette for it and then finally down to this piece. So the decision making, uh, it's lengthy, uh, it's time consuming. This work has become the centre point for Gallery 460's Bicentennial Sculpture Park, which is located in a picturesque setting midway between Gosford and Avoca Beach. Almost half the sculptures are already in the park and it's hoped by January next year all will be in place in time for the beginning of the Bicentennial year. The William IV will be launched on the first day of the Twin Rivers Festival. Today, while workers made sure every detail was ready for the big occasion, the vessel was given a special farewell from Raymond Terrace school children who have watched it taking shape over the last two and a half years. The children will be on school holidays when the paddle steamer is officially launched and so this was their chance to farewell it in style and to celebrate the start of the Twin Rivers Festival. 2,000 children from four local primary schools took part in the celebration, many giving the occasion an historical feel in period costume. Hours of practice went into the carefully choreographed dances, using individual schools or larger combined groups. Despite the heat, organisers say the day was a success and a clear indication of the children's attachment to a paddle steamer called William IV. Skating, dancing, dazzling costumes and laser shows, Las Vegas on Ice has it all. Featuring world and US champion skaters, the $10 million spectacular replaces the stage with ice and dancing skates. Using a giant refrigerator system, the skating troupe has transformed the theatre stage into an ice rink. And there's all kinds of dancing. We do uh, opening number, which, which Jane said earlier was like a Las Vegas type, very Las Vegas type number. We have a flash dance number, which is a real high energy, kind of a modern, um, modern type dancing number with a lot of skating in it actually. And just almost anything in between it you could imagine there's something in this show. I mean, one thing I like to stress on this show is it's the kind of thing that the whole family can come to and uh, sit down for two hours and really have a good time. Drawing Las Vegas audiences of 400,000 a year, the show is in Australia for the first time, promising glamour and energy. I think we all really enjoy entertaining and that's what Vegas is all about, I know that. And um, we're trying to bring that side of uh, entertainment to everybody here. Drivers and engineers sacked yesterday from the Richmond Vale Railway say they have no plans to give up their protest over the closure of the line. The men are holding a sit-in with a steam locomotive they commandeered from Hexham yesterday morning. A full report in tonight's news. For all the news, join us tonight at 6. The William IV is a replica of the first ocean-going steamship ever built in Australia. The original was built in 1831 by William Lowe at Clarence Town in the Hunter Valley. The idea to re-enact the launching of this historic ship was born in 1981. 
but in 1985 it became an official community bicentenary project. Since then, some $1.3 million have been poured into the job. That figure, however, belies the hours of community volunteer work and corporate sponsorship the William IV has attracted. Many skills, once forgotten, were resurrected to make this idea a reality. The figurehead was carved from a solid piece of wood, and the old steam engine has been painstakingly pieced together as close as possible to the original design. Today, thousands of people lined the banks of the river and crowded onto the nearby bridge to witness the launching. May God bless her and all who say her. For Tom Barnes, the man responsible for making sure the steamship would float, the launch was a great spectacle. I'm happy that this uh, traditional launch has come off so well. All my calculations have been right. How about that? I'm very satisfied. For others, it was an emotional moment steeped in heritage and family. Because the William IV was built by my grandfather, William Lowe, who arrived in Sydney in 1829 and eventually came to Clarence Town. So it's a very proud day for you? It's a very proud day for me. John, you wouldn't believe the people that have come forward and offered uh, service and help and equipment and advice and money too, strangely enough. We still need plenty more. We're looking for a major sponsor and we'd be very happy to talk to anyone along those lines. The project is far from over. The steam engine must still be commissioned and sea trials conducted. But by 1988, the William IV will be ready to help celebrate the bicentenary. Although a final result won't be known for several days, the ALP has lost ground in the Lake Macquarie elections. For the first time in three terms, Mayor Jeff Pasterfield has had to go to preferences in a bid to retain his title against independent challenger Ivan Welsh. Pasterfield polled 34,600 of the primary votes to Welsh's 31,100. But the position will be decided by the distribution of preferences from the third candidate, Fennell. Fennell, who has polled 14,000 primary votes, has directed his preferences to Welsh. Jeff Pasterfield has been mayor for the past 10 years. Although not admitting defeat, he blames the ALP's poor showing on bad timing. I think there was uh, a couple of issues around at the time that people were wanting to express, I think, to the ALP that uh, they were dissatisfied with them. I think the ID card was the, uh, the main one. Uh, and uh, also, of course, we had the announcement about Morissette Hospital, which uh, didn't do us any good at all. Meanwhile, Labor has improved its performance in Cessnock, where ALP candidate Mari Callaghan has taken a majority of the primary vote to oust Gordon Williams as mayor. Mari Callaghan, a marriage celebrant, won 63% of the primary votes. Counting for Port Stephenshire continued late last night. However, by 10.30 it was clear that former Shire President Roy Taylor would not be returned. Neither would Deputy Shire President Bill Hollier. The ALP, however, appears to have maintained its numbers in the new Shire, with one riding still to be counted. The floods in Bangladesh have been the worst in 40 years. Already the death toll stands at at least 1,100 and it's expected to rise. Jeff Gregory, the Northern New South Wales Area Manager for World Vision, has just returned from Bangladesh and he says money is urgently needed to help flood victims back onto their land. We've devised a rehabilitation program 
And that rehabilitation program will get people back onto their land as soon as the floodwaters subside around about November. We'll provide them with the grain to get their crops going once again because they've already lost about 12 months supply of their rice. Uh, we'll help them with uh, all of their health needs and that's going to be of prime importance because already about 40 or 50 children under the age of five have died from diarrhoea and dysentery and we expect that to run into the thousands within the next month or two. Donations for the appeal can be sent to World Vision headquarters in Melbourne. Up to 900 miners have been retrenched in the northern region and the sackings are certainly starting to have a disastrous effect on many families. Today, Employment and Youth Affairs Minister Clyde Holding arrived in the Hunter on a two-day visit which includes Maitland, Cessnock and Singleton. His main mission is to ensure that the federal government's $8 million package to help in the retraining of miners is spent in a useful and productive way. Today in Maitland he met with officers from the Commonwealth Employment Service, Social Security and Unions, as well as local politicians. He says a key job is to work out what alternative forms of employment are around in the area. Mr Holding is particularly concerned that miners are retrained for jobs that are actually available. He wants to ensure that the federal government's $8 million retraining package is spent properly and that the miners aren't further disillusioned. Well, the purpose primarily is, first of all, to discuss with the CES the arrangements that they've made uh, for the quick and efficient implementation of the coal industry package to see that miners have been retrenched to dealt with sympathetically uh, and there's an immediate sort of hands-on response to their particular problems. Mr Holding, people say that for every one job that goes in the mining industry, another job goes in flow-on industries. What kind of compensation is going to be given to those other industries that are affected? As of this stage, the package does not include any provisions to assist those people in service industries. But um, if that emerges out of these discussions, that's something I'll report back to Cabinet on. multi-purpose centre at Spears Point was a major issue at last week's council meetings. The Japanese tea ceremony room is unique. Only two universities have the facility. The other is in Western Australia. The tea ceremony is based on a 15th century tradition and participants must maintain virtual silence. An informal ceremony often runs for an hour, while a strictly formal ceremony can last for up to four hours. The Newcastle Tea Room will be open to the public, but will be particularly helpful to students of Japanese. If they study only Japanese language and they uh, don't uh, experience some Japanese uh, atmosphere or feelings, I don't think it is uh, terribly good. And uh, by uh, coming to this room, a uh, student uh, can really uh, feel uh, Japanese atmosphere, that would uh, give them extra stimulus uh, to study Japanese. Professor Ono says the tea ceremony is much more than a social event. Tea drinkers must observe four main principles, namely harmony, respect, purity and tranquility. And uh, they say that by uh, uh, practicing tea ceremony, you can improve your um, sense of beauty and social manners and perhaps uh, um, and self-discipline. The tea room features $7,000 worth of donated Japanese artefacts, including a tatami floor mat which came from Newcastle's sister city, Ube in Japan. Good afternoon, I'm Belinda Borisso. Tonight in NBN News we'll be bringing you a report on an arrangement in the United States that will enable even the very small Hunter Valley wineries to break into the American market. For all the news, join us tonight at 6.